So apparently you kids are allergic to reading. So I'm going to break this down for you all and talk you through it. A little bit of a talk through, if you will. Looking at Macbeth, key quotes and literary devices. We are going to look at hyperbole, foreshadowing, paradox, binary opposition, illusion, irony, motif, and soliloquy and assigns. So firstly, we have hyperbole. Hyperbole is an easy one to remember. It's when characters are being a little bit extra and everything trying to create some drama around their feelings. So like when Macbeth says, Will all great Neptune's oceans wash clean this blood from my hand? He is being a little bit OTT, but he kind of has a point. He will never be able to remove this stain of King Duncan's murder from his conscience. But I ain't got time for his emotions post-murder, you know? But if a character is being way dramatic, chances are it is hyperbole. What you need to think is, why? Why is this character being a little bit extra? What does their hyperbolic statement or reaction reveal about them? Then there's foreshadowing. Foreshadowing can be a little tricky only if you haven't read the text. This is because foreshadowing hints at events or realizations that will come later in the text. So if you haven't read Macbeth, then when we learn in the opening scene of Macbeth's actions on the battlefield, when he kills the Scottish traitor MacDonald and unseams him from the nave to the chops and fixes his head upon the battlements, you won't see the situational irony and foreshadowing of Macbeth's own fate. You need to examine what happens both in the future of the play and retrospectively in the play to identify where hints are given to the audience and the significance of that. One of the more complex devices is paradox. Paradox can be tricky to spot on the surface. So this is one where it definitely helps for you to watch the how to identify literary devices on our YouTube channel and use the checklist method. What you are looking for is two contradictory opposing ideas or concepts within the text. They may seem like they cancel each other out, but the actual effect is the opposite and it creates more of an emphasis around a representation. Take the line, this supernatural soliciting cannot be ill, cannot be good. They are two opposing ideas of ill and good. To understand the effect, you have to understand the context of the supernatural within the play. This is because the witches, fair is foul and foul is fair, constructs an ambiguous representation around their characters as well. So they are paralleled in Macbeth's own moral ambiguity in these lines. And as we know, Moral ambiguity is never a good thing. Unless, of course, you know, you're a wannabe murderer and all. A device very similar to this is binary opposition. However, in binary opposition, where there are two contrasting ideas, they are meant to be understood separately and specifically contrast with one another. So when Macbeth says, stars hide your fires, see not my black and deep desires, there is a distinct separation between the goodness associated with the stars of the heavens and the evil of the black and deep uh, connotations that alludes to the pits of hell. So Macbeth knows he shouldn't be thinking about killing the king. He is hyper aware of this contradiction, this moral contradiction within his thoughts. You know, being a thane and all. Illusion is another great device, but you have to have knowledge 
of the significance of what the illusion is referring to. So as illusion draws upon references to historical people, events, mythology and religion, you gotta know what that stuff means. These references are super powerful as it carries more insight to what is going on with the characters and in the play at that moment. So when, um, for example, when we see Macduff finds King Duncan murdered and he shouts, most sacrilegious murder hath broke oak the Lord's anointed ta- temple and stole thence the life of the building. For those of you who know your Bible or Christian teachings, there are echoes here of finding the tomb of Jesus empty. But this is a very perverted inversion of that. As in the Bible, Jesus had, in fact, risen from the dead. Whereas here, Duncan has been brutally slaughtered. Another tricky device is irony. Uh, But this is more so in its definition. I find that my students can always identify irony pretty easily. As an example, uh, it just becomes a little bit harder when they're trying to explain why it's ironic. So irony is when what appears to be a certain way is in fact quite the opposite in reality. And one of the most terrifically ironic lines is spoken by Lady Macbeth. When King Duncan arrives at her castle, she says, All our services in every point twice done and then done double. This is a great quote with many language devices, including hyperbole. But the reason it is ironic, however, is that the audience knows that Lady Macbeth is being a two-faced kingslayer. She can't wait for King Duncan to go to sleep. So all her curtsying and flattery is just a ruse. Poor King Duncan. He has no idea that the worst mistake he's going to make that day is going to bed. One of the easiest literary devices is motif. I have an entire video on motif alone on our channel. Please go and watch it. Motif alone is the single greatest study hack for learning quotes. Motif is the use of recurring imagery, symbols or language that is used to convey an idea. The examples of motif in Macbeth are numerous. Numerous! And there is great flexibility in how you can analyse them to link to your arguments. So in looking at the motif of blood, you can examine how it conveys ideas of guilt, conscience, perversion of the natural order, the social order, you know, the idea of bloodlines and blood ties, violence, life and death. And that's just what I can think of immediately. Know your motifs. I really love a good soliloquy or a sight. And that is because they are a great insight into the true thoughts of characters. More often than not, what individuals think privately is in opposition with their public appearance. I personally love Macbeth's to be thus is nothing but to be safely thus. Our fears in Banquo stick deep. One minute, he's all, don't miss dinner, bestie. It won't be the same without you. And next minute, he's confessing that he got to kill his boy. Okay? Soliloquies and asides tell us who our characters really are. Bonus! Yay! If you've made it this far with me, guess what? You get a bonus mystery device. What is our bonus mystery device? It is connotations and lexical choices. Why are connotations and lexical choices such a great device? Is because they can be used in conjunction with other devices. So they can corroborate 
your other pieces of analysis and really get to show off how good you are at deconstructing and analyzing your quotes. By examining certain words and their connotations, you can take your analysis to the next level. So in um, that same soliloquy, to be thus is nothing to be, but to be safely thus, Macbeth uses euphemisms such as barren scepter and fruitless crown. And we all know what that's alluding to, his infertility. So even more of a kick in a, the guts to Macbeth is Banquo's own prophecy that, you know, he will be father to a line of kings. Ouch, you know. <laughs> So Macbeth is doing a lot of compensating, if you know what I mean. Um, and it's all in the connotations of his words. So the important thing to remember here is that we are looking for the effect of the device. It is not enough to identify them or just name drop them into your essay. So what? What do they achieve? Here we are looking for you to dive into the specific nature of the device and why it is particularly telling. What doesn't an over-exaggeration of re emotion reveal about a character? This is an opportunity for you to showcase an understanding of not only values, attitudes and beliefs, but social context and cultural assumptions. But we might cover that in another video tutorial because word on the street is you also have only have 10 minute attention spans and I totally respect that. So thanks for joining us peeps.